Okay, so uh, so people who keep joining in here, uh, and you're all welcome to join the discussion here. This is Alina Seem here, uh, CEO of Influx. Hi. And as promised, we've got Boyan, uh, who's a director app development for Stewart and Stevenson. So just to kick off the discussion here, uh, let me first give an overview uh, of what this whole open roundtable is about. Uh, the idea is that you know instead of a one-way discussion, which usually the webinars are. Uh, where people can't really participate and you know get their thought process in and uh, and then you get a q and a session at the end of it which isn't really interactive uh, plus it's usually on the phone line so you can't really feel and you know understand each other uh, that better uh, you don't really understand who's talking and what they're talking right so so the whole idea is open table uh, open round table um, and we've actually tried to draw this diagram right here in front of you as a you know, round table as well so obviously right in the center of that table or the discussion is going to be JD Edwards. Uh, and around that is all the fun stuff on the cloud uh, that is you know, uh, all available uh, for the JD Edwards customers to leverage on. And then we're gonna be talking about the digital transformation uh, that is possible because of this integration that you can do with all these different SaaS applications and PaaS applications that are available out there. So uh, let's get started the discussion. Uh, the format for uh, the open table today is, as I said, the overview. I'm just gonna uh, discuss and kick it off. Uh, uh, then we'll have a very insightful discussion with Boyan, uh, and we'll try to understand within the digital transformation journey, where Steven Stevenson is, uh, where they're coming from, and where they're headed to. And uh, Boyan has been part of that whole journey for, for many, many years now. Uh, so we would love to hear him out, uh, his experiences, and uh, try to learn from that. And also, be, so the whole idea is it's going to be very interactive. Feel free to jump in, ask questions. Uh, you know, it's a good idea to maybe raise a hand uh, so that you know we can uh, not really talk on top of each other. So um, starting this out, uh, this diagram, which I really like in trying to understand digital transformation in context. I mean, there's a lot of buzzwords being thrown around. There's a lot of cloud discussions happening. IoT is you know, joining the party, dancing in there. But uh, what exactly all of that means for a real JD Edwards customers who's got real challenges to, uh, you know, uh, to fix, real problems to fix, a lot of legacy that they've built over time. What exactly does it all mean for a serious, uh, you know, uh, long time JD Edwards customers who, who's really invested in JD, into JD Edwards for decades? Uh, so obviously, when you talk about, let me try to uh, do a slideshow here. <clears throat> so the key is the operational backbone. And this is where the JD Edward modules are that you've implemented over years. I just listed out a few, but there could be much more. Uh, so the operational backbone is where most of your uh, core business processes are. You know, all of your uh, core business processes are, have, have been matured over time. All of your master data record is there. Uh, so all your systems of record is pretty much your JD Edwards ERP, right? Uh, when you talk about customer experience, you talk about in-store applications, you talk about point of sale, you talk about kiosk, you talk, talk about all sorts of different, uh, you know, even augmented reality now, uh, in-store, in et cetera, uh, that are all popping in. Uh, you also talk about CRM. You also talk about Salesforce automation, how you can have your field force uh, be completely mobile uh, and you know, make the decisions on the go. Uh, have that sort of agility at your Salesforce, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on the mobile app side, or all, uh, you know, the self-servicing for your customers and things like those. Uh, then you've got a challenge, which especially in the oil and gas and heavy equipment industry is, you know, the field service, uh, which plays a major part because especially today, where the com competition is tough, the prices are low. So you've got to uh, all the profit that you make is basically the dollar that you save, right? So from that perspective, uh, field service is a very, very critical component. So I'm just trying to get to the context, uh, kind of set to the set the context here that with JD Edwards core modules, when you're leveraging all the customer experience stuff, in-store, CRM, field service, e-commerce portals, uh, stuff like that, you gotta have a very strong backbone. Uh, and you have to have a good solid integration strategy. And we're gonna discuss with Boyan, uh, what exactly does that mean from the Stewart and Stevenson context when you talk about this overlap between the customer experience and operational backbone. Uh, the, the new kid in the block, which we uh, here are calling digital intelligence, which 
you know, comprised of all the different stuff. I don't know if you all can see this completely because of this video, but that they you know, comprises of your Internet of Things, your big data, analytics, machine learning, AI, and all the cool stuff that we hear. Um, so we're going to also see what that really means within the context of J.D. Edwards' operational backbone. What does that overlap really mean? How you can innovate your core business processes by leveraging on that intelligence uh, that these smart equipments can provide you. And how you can use that to make your field service even more agile uh, and you know, give them all the, the insights that they need while they're on the go serving the customers so that they can increase the upsell and things like those. Uh, the last but not the least, this is where everything gets together. And this is why we you know, have always thought of integration as a strong competitive advantage. Because when you talk about a transformation, all you're basically talking about is strong integration frameworks. And that's where your business services, your AIS, your IoT orchestrators, you know, your, your middleware, when you connect this, when you use this integration backbone, that's exactly where your digital transformation uh, you know, most of the time lies. So we'll talk about this magic zone right here, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to learn from Boyan as to what exactly that means from uh, Stewart and Stevenson's perspective, uh, this magic area. And that's precisely where our company is focused on, to make all of the, these things connect together, integrate together, and create that transformation for the customers. So thanks a lot, Boyan, for taking the time out. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, uh, and I, I know that you've got a production uh, system, uh, you know, going on. So uh, thanks a lot for taking the time out and being here uh, to discuss all the uh, experiences that you've had uh, with Steve and Stevenson. So I'd like to kick, kick start the discussion asking you, uh, seeing this diagram in front of you, how do you map Steve and Stevenson on this diagram? Where you are, what are, what are the overlaps that you've already done, and what are the ones that you've planned into the future? Okay, first of all, Ali, thanks for inviting me for this uh, round table and thanks for the, to the other participants spending their also valuable time to uh, listen to this and I invite them to um, share their experiences, ask the questions, you know, raise a hand any moment needed. As Ali said, my name is Bojan Vukicevic and I, I am with uh, Stuart and Stevenson. And uh, Stuart and Stevenson is a very conservative old company founded here in Houston, Texas in 1902, actually. We are a manufacturer and distributor of the products for the oil and gas, which is at this moment, I guess you would say, unfortunately, but it's going to be better, we all hope, right? Uh, power generation, uh, transportation, agriculture, uh, many other things. Basically, we are a big distributor for the diesel engines and uh, we do value-added manufacturing for everything that goes around the diesel engines. And uh, we are basically the biggest distributor for the diesel engines. So we have a lot of uh, partners, which are OEM manufacturer. Besides that, we also doing our rental, preventive maintenance, uh, service uh, and warranty for uh, all of our business partners. About myself, uh, I got introduced to uh, my good friend J.D. Edwards in 1988, and it's been an important partner in my career journey until uh, even you know these days, and I really hope that's going to continue. It's, uh, it's a great software. It's very, um, very flexible. It's uh, really good. Uh, it allows you to uh, do a many different solution out of the box. It's not so rigid and uh, as some other competitors are. Now, some people will find that, that uh, rigidness to be good because it can fence down uh, some um, user requests that are maybe not uh, exactly uh, cost effective, but uh, I like the freedom and the power because JD Edwards is not only ERP. JD Edwards is basically a software development tool. And whoever uses it well and knows how to use it well actually can create a great result and uh, immense, uh, huge savings, cost reduction or uh, efficiency improvement for, for their company. So what uh, about this uh, diagram here? So what's our situation? 
As a big distributor, we already depend on many different interoperability systems. Uh, again, this is very old-fashioned industry. I mean, I until recently I was receiving uh, interoperability specs in a 99999V99 format. I mean, we're talking about COBOL. But uh, recently I've seen improvements and I've seen that uh, some, um, let's say, more 21st century based inter uh, interoperability specs are coming. And that is our operational backbone and uh, also as we all know, situation in uh, oil and gas industry at this moment is a cost saving is a basically, I guess, num number one in everybody's mind uh, by, unfortunately, reduction of uh, workforce, probably number one for most uh, components, uh, most companies. The second one is usually inventory reduction. And then the third one is the improvement of the, I would say, customer experience. Now, many people would disagree with these uh, priorities that I just mentioned. That's just what I've seen so far in uh, some small area that I'm doing. it. So I'm not going to bother anybody with those uh, obsolete 99999 um, V99 uh, requests anymore. We are here to talk about latest and greatest technology that uh, since release 9.0 and especially since release 9.1, uh, JD Edwards basically um, very successfully, I would say, very successfully utilized the uh, Oracle components uh, for the integration and uh, deeply and semi-seamlessly integrated in a product itself. I mean, now my experience is going back a few years. Uh, I'm talking about uh, 9.1 with the 9.1.2.3 release. Uh, since then, and because I've run all of this uh, since the 9.1.3 uh, that uh, to 9.2 basically, uh, tools releases, not application releases. And uh, we using many, we have, significant uh, user end of the BSSV and of the JD Edwards vanilla mobility application, which uh, I guess most of all call AIS, because that's a technology that's used to implement the application integration server. And when I say significant, uh, one of the things that uh, long time ago, oh, by the way, I didn't mention uh, J. Stuart and Stevenson was the first production implementation of a CSMS, how was it named these days, customer service management uh, system. These days it's basically known as a SWNM, service work order, uh, work order and manufacturing. Oh, sorry, service warranty and manufacturing. So in these days we did have to do some uh, customizations and do some licensing. Uh, cost differences, we actually uh, catch the opportunity and build our other systems around the JD Edwards to be authenticated, the web applications to use actually JD Edwards as an uh, authentication engine. The main reason for that was uh, we realized quite soon that we're running HR and payroll modules in JD Edwards also, and due to that, those are basically the most precise and the cleanest data we have about our uh, employees. Because obviously, the employee data has to be perfect or you're gonna realize it after the first payroll check, right? So those data were actually better than uh, window, Windows Active Directory data and that's why we use it. So when we switch to 9.1, instead mm. of using the... Right, right. Of if, if I may ask a quick question. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, you also mentioned uh, in an offline discussion that you know you are leveraging both business services and AIS, and you are using the JD Edwards mobile apps as well. If you could shed a bit of yep. light on that, uh, especially from the perspective of what you're talking about, the service management and how sort of sure. the, what sort of sure. apps you're utilizing at this point. Just getting to there. So in a nine one, I basically first start utilizing BSSV uh, for the password maintenance, creation of the new user ID, as well as authenticating my um, uh, users, employees, basically, to my uh, different custom applications. So we build integration between uh, JD Edwards login system 
and various uh, custom web applications in the company using the BSSV. Uh, my average monthly at this moment, uh, I'm, I'm running about uh, 10,000 authentication every month, about 100 password reset, and uh, about 15, 17 creation of the new user every month. And uh, to knock on the hood, I still didn't have any problem that's uh, caused by the BSSV as a technology. I mean, those are, those are significant numbers. Also, beside that, we using BSSV to, uh, the second one, as we all know, unfortunately, uh, Vertex never fully implements, at least the time you know, of uh, reprint of the invoice calculating tax due date. So a reprint of the invoice through J.D. Edwards might actually result in an incorrect tax printed, which is a bad idea. So we are fetching AR invoices through the, uh, seamlessly for our users using the BSSV also. And we're talking also about heavy hits. We're talking about uh, hundreds of hits every day. Beside that, we also implemented a service order processing using the BSSVs. That's a fairly new product, and it's uh, still uh, located only on a few branches. It's a pilot still. So far, works good. Did not, again, did not have any problems with the BSSV itself. And you know, we're talking about. I'll get to that uh, back to that a little later. It's a heavy chunk of data, actually, that we're talking about. So all of those are basically proofs how the BSSV can be used and, to, for, and for the cost saving and for the customer experience because being able to recreate your forgotten password is actually very important for the customer experience itself. Unfortunately, JD Edwards does not provide it out of the box and especially millennials expect that to be part of the system itself and they're getting frustrated if they have to call some support center or anybody just to get their pass, the forgotten password reset. And as we know, that costs money because it's a probably at least half hour of the lost work at that moment. Uh, what else? Service order processing is also extremely important and uh, so far it's a vanilla now. We'll get back to later how that works. So that's on the BSSV side. On the JD vanilla mobile applications or AIS, however you want to uh, call it, we are running two applications. Uh, we're running a release held sales order and approve a purchase order request. Now importance of the release uh, held sales order, we have about 50 uh, point of sales in which we basically mostly spare uh, aftermarket for the parts for the diesel engines uh, and uh, 18 wheelers. Some of the our customers is even a, uh, even a government and uh, you know to different accounting uh, ways of doing a business and setting up of uh, uh, credit limits for the specific customer quite often it would happen that uh, on a outside of the standard work hours, meaning outside of the Monday to Friday, five to eight. And by the way, we are spreading them multiple time zones also throughout whole US. Very important customer would basically arrive to purchase a part and the sales order would be denied due to the credit uh, limit. This mobile application allow our credit managers to basically react immediately and release given sales order and uh, so not only that we prevent a lost sale incident, but we also retain the customer because the customer experience that on a Saturday came to your store and basically being denied a purchase of the, of the part that's extremely important for them because of some accounting issue is, uh, there is a big chance that the customer would not stop by back to your store ever again. So that was a real success and uh, as well as uh, approval of the purchase order uh, requests because uh, again, sometimes it happens 
as I said, oil and gas is trying to minimize the inventory. Now, reduction of the inventory is good from accounting standpoint, but increase the chance that something that's critically needed for the customer is not available and has to be purchased immediately. That speeds up the process and allow us to save quite often on a transportation method while keeping the same SLA for the customer, which helps. So, Right. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for that, Boyan. Uh, I would also like to maybe uh, have you shed some light on predictive maintenance aspect as well. And have you ex already experimented with some of the IoT uh, functionality that is out there, uh, even with JD Edwards IoT Orchestrator or uh, some past systems that you, you were utilizing before? We did not use uh, IoT Orchestrator. Uh, one good thing is we're running only one ERP which is a JD Edwards. So that uh, makes much easier to, uh, we, didn't, we didn't find a need for the IoT orchestrator. We can use a BSSV basically, and uh, that's something that I'm going to actually also talk a little bit more later. But uh, about our preventive maintenance and, uh, and basically attempt to do the data monetization, which is a very interesting topic these days, about uh, I don't know, six years ago, we started a program in which we would, with some partners, that we would actually download a utilization in hours of our rental fleet of the forklifts, which uh, we are working on that, still not there to basically implement uh, P, uh, PM uh, algorithms that would allow us to create, to make a PMs to be as needed, not on a pre-scheduled uh, timeframes, but it uh, helped us a lot to detect unit abuse. There is a limit of the number of hours in a day the unit is supposed to work, and uh, if it's pushed over that limit, that increases the chance of the failure. Obviously, as any rental, uh, unless you have a proof of uh, asset being misused, basically as a warrant, as a renter we would actually have to foot the cost of the maintenance this way uh, it's a it's a significant saving what we're trying now to implement also is to collect additional data like uh, impact like a tilt like a overload uh, oil pressure and would be nice but it's not right now in the horizon it's somewhere in my head for the future is to uh, actually connect that with uh, data of the operator of the asset and then be able to provide the customer finally with the information uh, basically give them a cross-reference of their drivers versus a uh, number of impacts or tilts or any other damaging to the to their system what we very successfully used is we provide uh, our customers with a uh, combined that way we could have do that Combine uh, basically what's a cost per hour of a using rental unit. Unfortunately, we are not as a, that far as a GE is, for example, to sell the asset usage per hour, but at least we can provide the customer with the precise data of the cost of the asset per hour, which some of them actually do appreciate. There are some other IoT things that we're trying to do, but uh, in my opinion, one of the most important thing uh, goals so to say in a iot is to avoid what we here uh, commonly call swivel chair we do not want operator to have to look at the one screen see the something happen and then turn the to different system and enter service order we're trying to do the full integration of that so right now for example we have a system that uh, one of our products are power generators. And uh, let's say, especially in hospitals, those power generators are quite often uh, set in uh, some secluded, fairly hidden places. And uh, missing fuel was not, uh, unfortunately, so uncommon. So we have basically a device that uh, notifies us when the level of the fuel in a tank is too low. The next part is going to be to basically generate immediately service order for technician to go there and take care of that because it might, uh, well, tank might be ruptured between other things and uh, definitely last thing that anybody wants to happen is if the hospital really needs a power generator, backup power generator, 
it doesn't start because of um, lack of uh, fuel. Of course, there is much more things. Um, newer diesel engines have a lot of sensors, I mean, similar as our cars right now, giving many data. And one of the projects and one of the, uh, is to utilize those data, try to collect enough information from those engines and use the big data to basically calculate prevent and maintenance thresholds or uh, indicators. And again, instead of doing a pre-schedule preventive maintenance, basically do the pre uh, just um, need the preventive maintenance. Right, that's a very useful sort of insight, uh, Vyan, and thanks a lot for, for sharing sure. that, especially you know the intricacies about uh, uh, you know how the oil and gas looks at IoT and how predictive maintenance can play the part within that grill. Uh, uh, just to uh, pull the participants into the discussion, uh, as I uh, introduced earlier, it's not a webinar. It's more like an open, you know, discussion. Uh, it's, it's an open table. Uh, so feel free to jump in. Feel free to ask questions that you might have, uh, which can mm -hmm. further uh, enrich the discussion. Uh, so I do see Kem. Uh, uh, hi, Kem. Nice to have you here. I see Craig here. Uh, so guys, feel free to have any questions uh, because we're going to be uh, wrapping up this session in, in about uh, ten minutes. So, you know, uh, let, yeah. let's have it more interactive, if you will. Yeah, please. I mean, I tend to talk too much, you know, so interrupt me any moment you want. <laughs> okay. Any question? Okay, then... Uh, I think we're connected on the voice, I guess. Let's this see. is Kim. I am uh, just on mute. I'm just listening. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Th thanks for uh, coming in, Kim. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks. So, okay. if, if that's okay, now I would. Uh, I was thinking uh, my plan was to talk a little about the differences between BSSV and AIS based on our experience. Now. Yes, please. So, the main difference to be kept in mind. AIS or uh, mobile applications based on AIS are basically only for the inbound traffic. Uh, AIS cannot be used, at least not easily. I mean, everything is possible, but it's not intended to be used to generate out, outgoing uh, events. It's, it's not meant to be used to generate requests for data. It's uh, meant only to process inbound data, versus the BSSV uh, can be used and for the inbound and for the outbound traffic. So that's something to, that has to be kept in mind. Setup was, uh, for both system is fairly simple. I would say the AIS is uh, maybe easier as uh, there are some small details about uh, that, um, it will not allow you to offload SSL, for example, on a um, load balancer. So you have to do it. Uh, you need to know how to handle that. But that's that's a minor detail. And uh, every ex CNC expert, as well as uh, any partner that's uh, in this, knows how to do it easily. I'm more going to focus on uh, functional side uh, rather than uh, that technical underground uh, details. So the second uh, most important thing uh, when considering to use a BSSV or AIS, AIS, in my opinion, is check for the vanilla, for the pre-delivered existing components. For example, JD uh, Edwards deliver a customer uh, BSSV customer service manager. Basically, there is a module that's capable of creating and uh, even updating uh, customer service orders, JP 17000000. From another standpoint, uh, for the sales uh, held order release or a mobile PO approval, those are pre-existing delivered mobile applications, M43071 or M43082. Now what uh, also keep in mind, one thing, they're going to work only if the form of the application on the JD Edwards application has not been changed. Uh, if you have enough time, we can actually get back to that later. Let, let's skip that for now. The second, uh, the third uh, important uh, thing to consider, in my opinion, is 
is the, the is does your process use a logic that's supposed to be maintained in a JD Edwards application, front interface application, or it's using logic that's supposed to be handled uh, on a enterprise server or even a JD Edwards API. That's be uh, for example my uh, uh, password reset is basically using JD Edwards API. Now, mobile applications cannot directly access JD Edwards API. And even uh, to access to the business functions logic, uh, they need to be ver used from some application. From another standpoint, uh, BSSVs cannot utilize application that uh, logic that's deployed in application. And now keep in mind some of that logic, uh, for example, sales, uh, the, the legacy sales order entry application. Uh, when you print it out, it's about 1.7 megabyte of a text code. We're talking about thousands of lines. Every time when they do the fi uh, fixed current, every time you do the upgrade, and the goal is to be able to get the upgrade as soon as possible. If you use uh, avoid using this logic, you will probably have to uh, readjust your code. It's much better if you basically can use uh, well, if you can use a logic that you already paid for and you're using for the manual data entry, so that's obviously much better. Second one, I mean, no, this is fourth one, I'm sorry. Uh, in my experience so far, machine-to-machine -machine integration BSSV is better for. Some people will maybe disagree, uh, but that's what I found so far. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, com complexity of the process itself. And as you remember, probably I just said the customer service manager is implemented by JD Edwards as a BSSV. Well, uh, serv uh, service order entry basically is a five screens. That's a complex process. Uh, my experience is that the more than two screens, if the date, if the process actually in JD Edwards client requires use more than a two screens, it's probably better to be considered as a BSSV unless some of those previous uh, uh, criteria already uh, switching it over the mobile. If it's a less than two screens, then probably a mobile application is better. And keep one thing in mind also, mobile applications operate uh, under the uh, credentials of the current user from a JD Edwards standpoint versus the BSSVs operate on a basically service account. And yes, uh, I know that nobody would ever, nobody should ever be in situation to do uh, debugging on a production system. But uh, I guess after a few years in IT, everybody learns that that's gonna happen sooner or later. It is easier to debug a mobile applications in production in case of the intermittent failure that cannot be reproduced uh, on a non-production environment because uh, in our case, considering a heavy, I mean, really heavy traffic that we're using on a BSSV, at the moment we turn it on a debugger, it starts creating enormous logs. I mean, there are ways to uh, remediate that, but uh, just as a, uh, one thing to be considered. So basically, that's uh, my view, my point on uh, how to choose between those two technologies. Now, Ali, I'm not sure. Uh, you probably, you probably have a different, uh, you have a experience with uh, much more, uh, with uh, many different customers, well, what do you think? Right, so our, so our experience has been mixed. Yes, uh, you're right, when it, it's more transactional, uh, more B2B uh, sort of transactional sort of integration. Uh, business services is more robust, uh, you know, uh, it does have, uh, uh, it definitely has that overhead, but at the same time, if you need more secure and more sort of uh, managed uh, transactional integration, uh, I would go for business services. And when we're talking about more sort of a chatty uh, integration where a stream of data is coming in uh, and you need to give a response within real time to the customers, the case in hand of mobile apps, uh, some cases could also uh, you know, uh, justify that for uh, web applications, uh, for self-service portals and you know, things like those. Uh, it could also make a good case uh, that you, you know, uh, the user experience, uh, where the need for the user experience is higher, 
uh, then being able to have that transactional, uh, in, I, I won't really call it integrity. Integrity is obviously going to be maintained, right? Either you go AIS or, or ESSV. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's our experience. And especially the IoT orchestrator, we feel is a wonderful tool uh, for so many reasons. AIS, as we know, is a wonderful tool in itself because it gives you all the functionality that you have in JD Edwards uh, in terms of this APIs. Uh, and that's a huge thing, right? Because with business services, you have to write everything yourself. Uh, you know, you do have pre-built services, you have pre-built C business function, but then you're talking about making sure that all the, uh, you know, business logic that is in there within JD Edwards is being complied to while making a quick integration to mobile app that can usually be missed out. And then you can, you know, debug and, you know, do a lot of uh, heavy lifting in regards to making sure that your uh, web interface and the mobile app interface uh, has the same integrity. But with the silent app, uh, you know, framework, uh, where you actually have the same app running in the background and you're doing the same steps that you would normally do, it's, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, coming back to IoT Orchestrator, uh, the fact that it's leverages on top of AIS makes it an amazing thing. Because, you know, IoT is something that is just starting to pick up and predictive maintenance and some of these use cases are the most obvious ones. But having said that, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to happen, uh, you know, uh, all across the enterprise and all sorts of business processes and all sorts of, uh, you know, JD Edward application would need that IoT data uh, and yeah. being able to respond to that sort of data in the real time. Uh, that's where I strongly feel that, you know, uh, AIS shines out big time uh, and IoT orchestrator and the workflow uh, that you can build orchestrations that you can build uh, with the IoT orchestrator studio and the ease with which you can integrate that with any application out there uh, at, at a very fast pace is what makes it shine out big time. Uh, there have been proprietary IoT frameworks that a lot of different customers have utilized over time, but they're very clunky. They're not scalable, right? So they, and they need a lot of investment, a lot of care, a lot of maintenance, uh, especially when you're upgrading your JD Edwards and you're upgrading your modules, uh, being able to keep a tap of all of those changes uh, because the touch points are going to keep increasing. You know, the integration point is going to keep increasing. As more and more smart appliances and devices come in, uh, you've got to maintain your business process integrity at the same time have that agility for all these different devices to connect. And I, I feel Orchestrator Studio with AIS uh, is, is awesome with that uh, sort of a thing. So we just have two minutes here. Uh, uh, and then we're going to have a short break. And then the, the next session is going to start. Uh, there's going to be a new session within the same URL. So if, uh, if anybody is interested, they can join back in using the same URL. Um, and that's going to be regarding the digital field service. Uh, we had a very good discussion with uh, JD Address Product Management team, uh, AJ Shifano, who heads the IoT and cloud uh, transformation initiative from JD Edwards perspective, and Pat Morales, uh, who heads uh, the business development. Uh, he, she's, she's a director of business development. Uh, so we had a really interesting discussion uh, back in November, uh, and we would like to share that uh, just after this session ends. Uh, so feel free to join in. We're going to take a five-minute break, and we're going to start that session. Thanks a lot, Bayan. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And oh, all the insightful discussion that we keep having regarding you know, all the things that are coming in, uh, uh, not just in the oil and gas industry, but the overall, and your expert okay. opinion on that are always so valued. Uh, thanks a lot for taking the time out. Okay. Really appreciate that. Thanks, Ali. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. okay. Thanks everybody for uh, listening to me. <laughs> Bye. Thanks everybody for participating. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. -bye.